spirited welcome to new participants and welcome back to those of you who have joined us in past conversations. We're really glad to have you here. This time, we're turning our attention to a very timely topic of equity and inclusion across our country. We have an incredibly richly diverse potential of, of audiences that we can reach with the Soil Health message at all scales. And I really mean that, you know, soil health works at all scales, whether it's a small urban garden plot all the way up to tens of thousands of acres of range. I think soil health applies everywhere, applies in different ways, and a very diverse group of people could all be involved, are involved in various parts of the country. And so the question here is, is our soil health message successfully reaching our historically underserved producers? We'd really like to make sure that we can do that. How can we approach this? Um, that's the question here today, and we have four leaders to share their success stories today. So please let us know if you know of others who could share their success stories. Diversity is, well, very diverse across the country. We have so much potential. You're going to hear from some parts of the country, and there's going to be other parts of the country where there's lots going on. We don't even know about it yet. So please don't hesitate to ask questions in the Q&A pod to uh, suggest additional areas of the country, additional populations that we should be having a conversation about. Um, we'd really like to expand this topic. I think there's a lot of potential here. So we can't possibly cover it in one conversation. We'll get a start today. Um, always looking for your input. So we have been designing this series primarily for our agency's field staff, but we're finding that a lot of folks in the public, uh, partners who work with us are also joining in. The idea here is to really gain ideas from each other to experience virtually across the country what it is that's being implemented and to then be able to draw on those lessons. Excitement and passion continue to grow across the agricultural sectors. And so our hope is that these conversations can help us all grow our understanding of how others are collaborating across organizations to take successful steps to ramp up soil health impact across the country. So. We hope that we can then adapt those insights in diverse situations with diverse customers to effectively ramp things up. And these conversations we know are inspiring some networking between states. So we're really hoping to contribute to further building of those networks, to sharing successes, lessons learned, challenges, get everybody thinking about it together for how we engage with the agricultural community at large, the very diverse community that's out there solving problems, continuing to find solutions that lead to increased adoption of soil health management systems across the country. So as we continue this series, please do share your ideas for upcoming broadcasts. We're always looking for further questions, challenges, your key soil health topics that you'd like us to address. We want to know if you have speakers to recommend. We would like to know if you yourself have some insights or successes or solutions to challenges that you would like to share with us. So really let us know what topics are near and dear to you in the field, and we'd like to address those with you. We all have more to learn along our soil health journey, and we all have something valuable to share. So let's keep on sharing across state lines, across production systems, across the diverse populations that we can reach, across land uses. There's a lot to learn here. These conversations are available on our agency YouTube channel, so you can find those usually a, a bit after we broadcast them. We will continue to record and share these sessions both internally and externally. We make them available through the NRCS Soil Health team on MS Teams, so any of you who are USDA employees can become a member of that team if you aren't already. You can use the Q&A pod to ask questions at any time during the presentation or discussion today. Sharing insights from their work today with historically underserved producers are Victor Hernandez from California, Amy Cook from Hawaii, Manuel Matas from Puerto Rico, and Pamela Voller from Alaska. So we really look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you for being on with us today. Team, please uh, take it away. Enjoy the conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Welcome, everybody. Our first speaker today is uh, Victor M. Hernandez. He started his, his federal career in the U.S. Marine Corps at the age of 17. He joined the USDA family in 2006 as a loan officer 
at FSA and concurrently served as business department chair at Santa Barbara College. He's been serving as outreach coordinator for NRCS since 2015 and has since evolved the Latino Farmer Conference and the Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers, among other outreach initiatives with veterans and the Southeast Asian community. Hernandez has served as an EDS instructor, working effectively with Hispanic producers, detailed as public affairs and outreach director, and is the standing president of the National Organization of Professional Hispanic NRCS Employees and the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coordinator in California. So it's our pleasure to uh, work out, to welcome Victor, and Victor will turn the, the presentation over to you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present on Striving Toward Equity and Civil Rights Compliance in Conservation Program Delivery. I'm Victor Hernandez, and I'm your Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Conservation Service in California. Well, a little bit about me. Uh, my history began in, 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 the, in the fields of the Santa Maria Valley, where both my parents were farm workers and farm laborers in the, on the Central Coast, uh, cycling anything from celery, broccoli, cauliflower, and lettuce. Um, I, actually, both of my grandfathers on both sides uh, also did their patriotic duty as braceros during the the U.S. Bracero program, picking lettuce in the lettuce fields of Salinas and working in the tobacco and cotton fields of North Carolina and Georgia. As, as, we, as we move forward, uh, I want to present to you uh, how, how we've come to the point of doing uh, a concerted effort to reaching historically underserved customers. Now, when we, we say historically underserved customers, what we're talking about historically underserved customers in conservation contracting. And we're going to focus today on soil health. Our learning objectives. As we move forward, we're going to talk about why. And we're going to address parity. Now, when we talk about parity, we're talking about equity. Equity in service for conservation compliance, for, con for civil rights compliance in program delivery. We're going to move into the how. You know, being intentional with our outreach. And then finally, we're going to end with the what as far as how do we go about uh, producing strategic outreach support for our leadership and for our district conservationists and soil health specialists across, across the field and across the country. So why? Why parity? Uh, and we're, again, when we say parity, we're talking about equity, equity and program delivery uh, with a specific overarching uh, goal of civil rights compliance in conservation program delivery. Well, the USDA has a history, and it's a history of civil rights complaints. It primarily stems from the former uh, Farmer Home Administration that later became the Farm Service Agency with loan and, 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 pro and catastrophe level crop insurance programs and also the rural and now rural development. However, we are one USDA, and as the one USDA family, we're a reflection of all the customers we serve. More specifically, uh, we had a series of civil rights lawsuits with Pickford One which resulted in $1.6 in restitution to uh, black and African-American farmers across the U.S. That was followed by Pickford II, which resulted in $1.25 in restitution to black farmers and African-American farmers across the United States. That then followed in Keep Siegel versus the USDA, which resulted in $760 million in restitution to Native American and tribal nations across the country. And finally, more recently, uh, between 2011 and 2013, the Women and Hispanic Civil Rights Lawsuit, which resulted in $207 million in restitution to women and Hispanic farmers across the U.S. And more recently, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture uh, spoke about the state of, of the black farmer, moving forward towards uh, providing more restitution to black farmers and ranchers across the U.S. So when we talk about why parity, and specifically, why equity in program delivery? Well, the taxpayer demands it. And ultimately, it's our, our duty as civil, as civil service employees to ensure that we're providing equitable service for program delivery, for pro, uh, fund distribution, and also a, a diversity of programs uh, distributed to farmers and ranchers across the U.S. So how do we go about uh, doing, how do we go about equity and service 
and, and doing strategic outreach. Well, it goes without saying, we've got to be intentional with the outreach. And now when we say intentional, well, we want to make sure that we're, what we're doing is that we're reflecting on the data so that we let the data drive the strategy. And so with, within the Natural Resource Conservation Service, we have a report. It's called, it's generated by the Program Results System, and it's called a parity report. The parity report essentially gives you a reading on the number of farmers based on the U.S. Ag Census and, all, and also uh, total farmers contracted within a given calendar year. So here in the state of California, we currently have just over 77,000 registered farmers in 2020. We contracted with about 2,500 farmers uh, across the state of California, which we're, so we're serving farmers at a 3% state benchmark. So 3% becomes a state benchmark for serving all farmers in general. Now we take a deeper dive and take, and take a look at the state baseline. And now when we're looking at the state baseline, we're looking at the, the, the larger demographic of farmers compared to all other uh, smaller demographic of farmers. So in this case, in 2020, we, served, we had about 61,500 registered non-Hispanic white farmers. This is our, lar our largest demographic in the state of California. And we contracted with about 1,900 of the, of, the, of the total farmers, or 3% of the white farming demographic. So this establishes 3% that's the state parity baseline. Now, as a state, when the state leadership takes a look at the state parity baseline, we then take that deeper dive county by county. So in the state of California, 58 counties, uh, 58 district conservationists is essentially uh, creating strategic outreach efforts for a concerted effort to reach those historically underserved pockets of communities or pockets of farmers within their service districts. So for example, here in California, uh, we, we've evolved a Latino Farmer Conference. We call it the Growing Together Latino Farmers, Juntos Creciendo, Conferencia del Agricultor Latino. Here what you're seeing is, is, is a, a representation of the map with the parity data. Well, this conference launched in Fresno, and Fresno is, is, is in the blue. You can see blue is 3% parity baseline. However, the, the county of Fresno is surrounded by counties that are red, yellow, uh, green, and orange. And so these, these are counties that are underrepresented in conservation contracts. And so we work to uh, make a concerted effort to extend the reach to, to this historically underserved population group in, in, in across the state. We've gone from Fresno to Monterey to south, southeast, southwest Riverside to Santa Maria to Tulare. And, uh, and as we move this initiative forward, we've reached over 1,200 uh, Latino farmers of the 14,000 registered in the state of California. Well, that's still less than 1%. However, uh, it's, it's making a great stride towards reaching a historically underserved uh, group of farmers in the state of California. So, so what? How, how, does, how, do, how do we move towards uh, creating uh, th these, these programs? Well, we've, we've, we've worked with a series of communities. We've gone from the Latino Farmer Conference to the Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers working with women farmers, uh, with veteran farmers, and also working with the Southeast Asian community farmers. And what we want to do here is when, when, we, when we create these conferences, we're making it a one-stop shop for resources on with soil health practices, working with partners that are traditional partners like the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, the Water Districts, the Agricultural Commissioners, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, but then also bringing in non-traditional partners. So bringing in business resources like the Small Business Administration or the Small Business Development Center, or mentors, also working with our Chambers of Commerce like the Hispanic Chambers of Commerce or the Black Chambers of Commerce or California Asian Chambers of Commerce uh, to ensure that we're bringing in a, a well-rounded uh, table of resources for our farmers and ranchers of, across the state. So business resources, agricultural resources, and educational resources. And then we're in the field uh, doing uh, soil health uh, in, in action so that the farmers can feel and see what soil health looks like. As, uh, during, during these conferences, we, we make a concerted effort to, to then present on the topics that are of highest interest to the farmers and ranchers. Here, I'd like to highlight uh, one of our keynote speakers, actually at our second Latino Farmer Conference, Javier Zamora, 
who is based out of Aromas, just out that's over in Monterey County on the Central Coast. Here, um, Mr. Zamora has done several different types of soil health practices, like doing pollinator habitats with the, as you can see here in the image, with the with the beautiful flowers on 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 the on, on the hedges of, of of his rows. Also working with uh, micro sprinklers and micro irrigation irrigation sensors, uh, creating a, a, a crop rotation for building organic matter, and also with the a, a nu nutrient management program. And these are the types of topics that we bring to the conference: uh, introduction to soil health, nutrient management biodiversity, biosolarization, organic farm operations, irrigation water management, and then also talking about some of the regulatory programs like the State Groundwater Management Act and USDA programs. So what's the outcome? Uh, the outcome is uh, that when, when, when the state takes a look at the parity data uh, from the program result system and they look at equity and program delivery, they're able to then take that deeper dive on, on a county level and, and then begin to work with that with conservation district to develop their local working group. And so the local working group is a, is a standing committee at that local district level that, that then brings in traditional and non-traditional partners to extend the reach and create tentacles into the community so that we can have a, a greater representation of the communities that we're serving. And that is strategic outreach. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. If you have any questions, uh, you can reach me here. You have my contact information. And that's the end of the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, Victor. And we'll hold a few questions uh, until all the presenters have presented. So thank you very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you later. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. Hey, this is uh, Marlon. Uh, thank you Our very much. Our next presenter for... is Amy. Uh, just a just a comment here for Victor. Victor, will you tell us just quickly verbally where you find that parity report? Can't hear. <clears throat> we can't hear you, Victor. Thank you. Just turned on the mic. Uh, so you can find your parity report if you go to your home website and go to the employee website where you usually get your web TA. You're going to see a link for the program result system. Uh, the acronym is PRS. And every employee uh, should have access to that website. There's no, um, you don't need any special certifications to, to enter that. Normally we have a, a link to enter. Uh, when you enter, you're going to notice um, on the far right hand side uh, where you'll see parity report and, and just click on that link and, and follow the, the steps and you'll be able to access the, the parity data report. Okay, thank you, Victor. And I see in the chat that Marcos uh, Perez has given us a link for that. So, all right, well, hopefully we have a few more questions at the end of the presentation for you. Candy, let's uh, continue the recording. who is the Assistant Director for Soil Science, State Soil Scientist, for the Pacific Island area. She started her career as, NR, as an NRCS SCEP student in Wyoming, but soon was drawn to warmer climates and the promise of working in tropical and volcanic soils in Hawaii. Amy has worked with NRCS Pacific Islands area for over 15 years, where she currently oversees soil science, soil health, GIS, NRI, among other duties for Hawaii and the islands of the Pacific. She earned her bachelor's degree in environmental science from Virginia Tech and a master's degree in soil science from Utah State University. Go Aggies! Uh, all right, Amy, we'll turn the time over to you for your presentation. All right. Thanks, Marlon. I'm excited to be here today, and um, before we get started, just wanted to kind of introduce you to the Pacific Islands area. Um, we consist of multiple islands all the way across the Pacific. Uh, in fact, the, the width of where our islands are equates roughly to the size of the continental U.S., so that's pretty broad stretch. Uh, moving from east 
to west, first of all, we have Farm Bill service areas in the state of Hawaii, in American Samoa, in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana. Mariana Islands and the territory of Guam. And then we also cover the freely associated states of the Republic of Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And I am based in Hilo, which is the easternmost little green star there in the state of Hawaii. So PIA is dedicated to improving soil health, and it is a key component, in fact, of our overall strategic plan that we developed in 2020. Uh, and that includes our vision of resilient islands with clean and abundant water, healthy soils, and thriving agricultural communities. Today, we'll see examples of soil health success across PIA. Here in the photo, you can see some of the key components of our soil health systems, such as perennial peanut, uh, daikon radish, uh, some beautiful coconut husk mulch, and gliracidia. Uh, so first, a little bit about who we are. Uh, agriculture across Hawaii and the Pacific Islands is extremely diverse in terms of crops and livestock, farm size, land tenure, as well as producers. Many of our producers identify as Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, such as Chamorro, Samoan, or Micronesian, and Asian, including Filipino, Japanese, Thai, and Chinese. Uh, many producers identify as having more than one race. So this uh, here, you can see the makeup of our PIA customers um, receiving farm bill assistance in fiscal year 2020. Also worth noting, 30% of our customers were female in 2020. 48% of our equip contracts and 15% of our CSP contracts went to beginning farmers and ranchers. So we have a very diverse base that we serve. Now, moving on to what we do. Uh, our tropical environment means a 365 day growing season, which allows multiple cash crops in a given year but can also translate to increased tillage, bare soil due to more turnover of, of crop rotations, and organic matter depletion in, in the hot tropical environment that we have. Uh, by incorporating soil health practices, we can help replenish that soil organic matter, protect soil from erosion during common heavy rainfall events, and also to introduce diversity into traditional cropping systems. Typical crops, include row and truck crops like ginger, sweet potato, uh, mixed vegetables. And we also have orchard crops consisting of tropical fruits and nuts such as papaya, macadamia nuts, and the one everyone loves, coffee. Uh, it can be challenging, however, to adapt practices and to find equipment to fit small farm operations. So the first stop on our tour is the island of Maui in the state of Hawaii. Uh, farmers here have been using soil health practices for quite a while, and now they're kind of fine-tuning things. Um, they've adopted soil health practices, and they're enhancing the results by optimizing the timing of their cover crops so that they are putting cover crops in when their cash crops would be a little bit less productive, perhaps in the winter months. Uh, dialing in specific cover crop mixes to achieve conservation goals like natural pest suppression and decreased fertilizer inputs. And they're also interested in locally sourced biochar as a source of organic matter, um, as well as planting smarter by using vetiver for erosion control and gliracidia for both a windbreak and a chop and drop mulch. Um, worth noting here, you can see kind of a typical row crop up in the upper left. And in the bottom right, you can see a field of sun hemp, which is actually uh, commonly used. It can help with nematode suppression. So that's one example of a natural pest suppression through cover crops. Um, and then up in the top, we have a buckwheat and sun hemp. 
So next up, we're going to go to American Samoa, where on a typical farm, the crop field will always have taro and banana as the main crops. Uh, and you can see those in the top two photos there. With an agroforest on the back side of the field that incorporates fruit trees, natives, as well as cultural plantings. Um, C CSP has been a really important program for American Samoa in incorporating some of these different practices into their traditional agroforestry. Uh, agroforestry is a soil health success kind of by default, by its, by its design. So it enhances plant diversity and productivity. It increases the ground cover. It improves organic matter. Um, and then <clears throat> added benefits include decreased erosion on steep slopes when vegetative barriers are um, installed. So you can see that here in the bottom photo. You can see this vegetative vetiver barrier is established. There's a couple different rows along the contour and then there's plantings in between and then the, the forest would be beyond that. Just a little close up, so there's a lot of steep slopes as well as abundant rainfall in American Samoa. So the vegetative barrier is very popular and very effective at decreasing soil erosion and keeping soil in place on the landscape. Uh, so couple different options, both lemongrass and vetiver are used, and there are local sources. Um, this is planted by the plant um, through a start versus a seed, and those are available from the local university. All right, now we're going to move on to Guam. So farmers in Guam are using mulching, crop rotation, residue management, and, and no-till or strip-till um, as for soil health practices. Here you see Brian Leon Guero's farm, where he plants a crop rotation of tomatoes, cucumber, and sun hemp. And the sun hemp, which is a legume, is a natural nitrogen fixer. So that's an added benefit in the, the tropical soils. And you can note the sun hemp nodules in the top right photo. On um, the top left, you can see cucumbers growing, and there is some um, you know, vegetation still left, so there are live roots in the soil. And then on the bottom, you can see the, the sun hemp cover crop growing. Next, I wanted to share a Guam success story. Uh, while teaching a soil health training in 2019, we visited the farm pictured here. The farm's located in northern Guam, where the soils are very shallow to limestone. So this producer utilized local source of compost, which you see on the far left, as well as recycled paper uh, to essentially build planting beds, as you see here in this far right photo. Um, so this particular area, our field was being prepared to plant into watermelon. Um, other crops included beans and bitter melon that were grown um, on trellises, as you can see in this photo here, the second from the, the right. So the, the compost and the paper were applied on top of the grass. So they served as a natural herbicide. And benefits included buffered pH, which was important with the limestone bedrock that was being planted into, um, increased organic matter, as well as soil depth. This is the soil building, essentially, um, practice. And so uh, weed suppression was natural. There is no need to have herbicide. And then you can see that um, there's these strips here. So they would be alternating crop versus grass. So that, again, that live root is staying in the soil. And then um, another added benefit of having light colored paper mulch is that that's helping to reflect a lot of the solar energy coming in. So therefore, it's helping to keep the soil cooler, which is really important because it's super hot and humid all year round in Guam. And so that's helping to keep the roots, keep all the little critters running around in the soil a little bit cooler under that cover. Uh, other crops grown on the farm include bitter melon, beans, banana, and papaya. And so I really just wanted to share this example. Uh, when I went to the farm, I was really impressed because in this case, soil health practices aren't just enhancing, but they're actually making 
production possible. And it just kind of shows that the soil health principles that we follow are universal, but how we adapt and adopt them locally can be quite unique. And um, so I hope you enjoy seeing this success story. Um, also a side note on this, um, this producer has a very um, farm that's very well known. He's reputable. He said when he goes to deliver his produce to various stores, it sells out within a couple of hours because people know that he has that quality of produce um, that is really coveted because there isn't a lot of uh, local food production in Guam right now. So last but not least, we're going to go on to Saipan, which is one of the islands of the Northern Marianas Islands. Uh, here, soil health practices are being used on cropland. Sourcing cover crop seeds has proved to be a challenge. Um, it's just a little too far from the U.S. mainland to, to get seed shipped in. Uh, there's, they've tried to get things in from Asia or other sources from the uh, other direction, but that can cause its own challenges with import permits and um, seed viability or pests, you know, if things being denied at uh, entry. So um, here you can see they've become creative in using mung bean as a cover crop. Um, you can see it in the top left. Um, on the top right, you can see the mung bean mixed with a vegetative barrier of vetiver. And then here um, on the, the inside left or right, I'm sorry, is the mung bean flowering right before it's going to be incorporated. Um, so here, um, vegetative barrier, the vetiver grass, contour farming, residue management, strip till are all implemented through an equip contract with Mr. Jonas, who is pictured here on the bottom left, planting a vegetative barrier with vetiver. Um, and with that, I want, I hope you, I'd like to thank our field offices for contributing the photos and the stories presented here today. Um, some of them I've taken when I've been lucky enough to travel throughout the islands, but um, a special thanks to all the contributions that came in from our local field offices. So I hope that you enjoyed your virtual tour of our islands and look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Very informative uh, uh, Thank you, Candy, for stopping that. Hey, I just had one comment for you, uh, uh, Amy, and I, I just was impressed with the thought that, that you said these practices are, or these principles are universal, but how unique uh, it is that how these small producers that you're working with in the islands, how they're implemented, it just impresses me, so uh, just intriguing. Also, during the question and answer period, I'm going to ask you more questions about perennial peanut, because now all of a sudden I'm kind of excited about it, a, a cover crop that I've never uh, worked with before, and I know it's a, a very warm season type crop, but uh, anyway. Okay. With that, uh, maybe let's continue uh, onward, Candy. For the, for the day will be Manuel Matos Rodriguez. Manuel Matos is currently the state soil scientist soil health and wetland team leader for the USDA, NRCS, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands. In 2002, he graduated with honors from the University of Puerto Rico with a bachelor's in agronomy and soils and a master's degree in soil science. Manuel began his career with NRCS in January 2004 as a soil scientist in Fargo, North Dakota after four years updating Soil surveys in the Red River Valley of the North, he was offered a position in Thief River Falls, Minnesota as a resource soil scientist. In Minnesota, he provided technical soil services for 13 counties. He also served as an acting Minnesota state soil scientist. Before joining the Caribbean area, he worked in 
uh, Traverse, Florida as an MLRA soil survey leader. In Traverse, he's supervised a team of soil scientists to update soil surveys in 34 counties in Central Florida. Later, he moved to Puerto Rico and served for four years in MyWES, the MyWES soil survey office leader. He was he where he supervised a team of soil scientists with the main task of updating soil surveys for Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. Manuel has worked closely with NRCS leadership and civil rights committees across the nation and has made significant contributions to recruiting, hiring, and retention of NRCS employees in several states. For these efforts, he has been recognized in multiple occasions. He was the recipient of the NOPL Award in 2006. Uh, outstanding member award and North Dakota Civil Rights Award and National Civil Rights Group Awards in two instances, 2006-2021, and the recipient of 2018 USD Undersecretary Honors Awards and serves as a presenter in multiple conferences on and on multiple committees. So with that, uh, Manuel, we'll turn the time over to you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Manuel Matos Rodriguez. I'm the state soil scientist uh, for Puerto Rico and uh, USBI. I really appreciate the uh, Soil Health Division for this uh, tremendous opportunity. Today, I would like to talk about the NRCS Caribbean area soil health efforts and challenges. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction of the Caribbean area team, the soil health uh, strategy, soil health efforts, uh, limitation and challenges, and uh, there's going to be an, uh, a section of uh, questions. With the NRCS soil health team, uh, in NRCS uh, Caribbean area, we have uh, eight field offices uh, in addition to the state office. and this effort of uh, soil health, it's uh, shared uh, with the Caribbean Area Soils Division, the Ecological Sciences, and we also are active uh, working with the Maya West Emerald Soil Survey Office on, under the Soil and Plant Science Division. Let's talk about a little bit of our customers, uh, Puerto Rico, and USBI, it, over 90% uh, are uh, classified uh, by the federal government that historically underserved, mainly Hispanic and Latino in Puerto Rico and African Americans in the US Virgin Islands. Uh, we have other ethnic groups and, uh, and it's a, a pretty diverse uh, demographic. Let's, before I talk about the soil health, I would like to visit a bit uh, to put in perspective uh, the agriculture and conservation history uh, of, uh, of Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, prior the conquest of Puerto Rico, uh, for example, that was in 1493, we have the uh, Caribbean, uh, uh, Caribbean uh, Indians. Uh, those were the Taino, the last ones that were here, and they had their, their own agriculture, right, uh, where they plant starchy crops uh, like uh, uh, roots and growth roots uh, later evolved to plant uh, maize. Uh, their main uh, crop was the cassava. But after that, they do it uh, through the conico, uh, conuco, what was, that was the, how they call it. But... After that, uh, 1493, Puerto Rico, uh, it was conquest in, uh, by the Spanish uh, conquistadors, and that uh, changed dramatically on the way that uh, the land was managed, uh, bringing with them uh, crops like uh, sugarcane, uh, coffee, uh, tobacco, uh, and other uh, starchy crops. And it, the, the, the island was evolving uh, against time, uh, and, 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 you know, increasing the acres of agriculture. It was uh, later in uh, or early 1900s, uh, just after the Hispanic-American War, 
1898, where all of these uh, agriculture efforts really uh, exploded, right? Uh, and for Puerto Rico and uh, in the case of Virgin Islands, uh, uh, all of these fields in sugarcane increased dram dramatically. For example, for our coast, uh, it, it changed the way uh, agriculture, it, it, it got affected uh, in, in the way that uh, the, how the drainage was treated, but the implications that that could have in, in, in soil health uh, was, uh, was tremendous. And also with the coffee in the mountains, uh, the, most of the coffee was planted under the shade and kind of uh, right after mid 1950s uh, that started changing to uh, coffee without shade that and also the treatment to the soil that increase in problems of, uh, for example, erosion and sedimentation. Um, talking a little bit of a conservation history for NRCS, uh, NRCS has been in Puerto Rico since 1935, similar to uh, in the uh, continental US. Uh, conservation districts been established in 1946. It was uh, several efforts of conservation. We have uh, the, the conservation uh, uh, corps and groups of people that help tremendously with, uh, with the effort. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, over uh, since 1935 till now, there's uh, over 15,000 uh, uh, conservation uh, plans that have been uh, established. So with that and giving that perspective, uh, as uh, many other states, we developed the Caribbean Area Soil Health Strategy uh, with a vision to support the NRCS mission by elevating the delivery of soil health, science-based information, training, technical resources, outreach uh, to an outreach to NRCS employees, customers, and partners uh, to basically improve soil health and functions in the Caribbean uh, working lands, uh, similar to other places uh, to provide soil health leadership, enhance technical excellence, increase soil health management, system implementation, span education, build and enhance partnerships, and evaluate, quantify, and share benefits and outcomes. Um, we're in the process of building uh, of a soil health library for tropical soils. Uh, we're also uh, very active uh, getting to know our clients, uh, demographics, uh, where, where we're not uh, getting or our services are not getting. Um, and also investing quite a bit of time to a strength uh, partnership with our with our uh, 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 partners in conservation and also uh, the Caribbean area island uh, farmers. Uh, talking about the top 10, top 10 conservation practices for soil health, uh, this is the list, uh, residue and tillage management, conservation covers, uh, critical area planting, multi-study cropping, conservation crop rotation, field border, field filter strips, prescribed grazing, repairing buffer, uh, forest buffer, repairing herbaceous covers, tree sharp establishment, grass waterway, silver pasture. Two, mainly the, the two major research concerns are soil organism habitat loss or degradation and soil organic matter and depletion. And we also could have a little bit of a, a aggregate instability. Um, we have uh, spent a lot of uh, time in collaboration with the Soil Health Division and our partners to provide formal, formal and on-the-job training to our employees and, and partners, uh, and also developing uh, and making sure that we have uh, latest technology and tools for our employees and partners to, to help with this effort. We're also uh, increasing the soil health management system implementation. Uh, one of the things that we have identified, and I don't know if this is because of the 1985 uh, change in the Farm Bill and how uh, NRCS uh, uh, used to do business, uh, but we're, we're seeing uh, conservation plans that uh, might not be as complete to help uh, and be assisted by uh, soil health uh, uh, and conservation practices that 
are more tell your soul health. So we're investing uh, time to work with our planners to make sure that they make uh, more complete conservation plans and holistic. Um, we're also built on coffee, banana, and plant say and plantain soil health management systems. That is uh, like a short-term strategy, uh, working with a scenarios uh, that fulfill soil health principles and uh, uh, NCAP uh, 116. Work with farmers that are stewards of soil health and have implemented soil health management systems and also increase the implementation of on-farm trials with soil health ma management systems through agreements, through partnerships, and working with our uh, farmers and producers. And talking about partnerships, uh, active grants and agreements, we have actually two national CIGs that were granted uh, last year uh, for this fiscal year. Uh, mainly for to implement an on-farm trials in uh, this will represent around 20 on-farm trial, trials between these two national uh, CIGs. Uh, we have other eight local that uh, deals with uh, uh, the validation of cover crops, equipment, uh, and uh, uh, conservation practices. Uh, and we have three special initiative. Uh, two examples are the coffee initiative and the joint chief uh, for landscape restoration. We're also building on new collaborations on soil health for research, education, and outreach. And I put uh, all the logos uh, for most of our active partners for in, in this effort. Let's talk about uh, a few examples of uh, soil health. Uh, and, and example of, of how farmers are using conservation practices and what benefits, uh, challenges, uh, and opportunities they're facing. For example, this is a farm called El Finca El Remanso. This is uh, in the Maricao, Puerto Rico municipality. Uh, these are, uh, this is a small farm of coffee production in West Central. And this is a humid uh, mountains where, where mainly the soils are uh, classified as alti soils. Just uh, uh, to give you an idea, their top soil is just five to seven inches. To and that just make really important that uh, we protect that soft top soil with conservation practices. They use uh, conservation covers, contour farmer shade increasing pollinator habit, habitat, uh, mulching, multi-study cropping, trails, and, and walkways. Um, this is a farm that they have been collaborators uh, and cooperators with NRCS for probably uh, about a decade now. But the, the reason I use this example is because uh, it's, a, it's a really good example of uh, resiliency. Um, this farm, like any other farms in the central uh, Puerto, Puerto Rico got hit really hard by Hurricane Maria near mine 2017. And uh, we got the opportunity actually to visit different coffee farms in the region. And by our surprise, uh, when we visit Finca El Remanso, of course it was the, the shade trees, they, they were down, the coffee was affected. I can't remember the percent of trees they lost. Uh, however, in comparison with other farms, this farm was uh, doing very well in comparison with the other ones. Uh, and to give you a good fact, um, that year they had uh, this flowering that it was unbelievable. Nothing compared with other farms that they, they were able to harvest coffee. And this was, as the, the point here is that it was uh, uh, at the level of soil health or soil quality that 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 this soil was uh, to you know uh, fight or uh, be resilient again against uh, the the effect of the hur the hurricane. So I think uh, this is a really good example of uh, how soil health could provide really good uh, benefits. The other example that I want to use today. And this is the Baranera Fabre. Uh, this is a, a, a 
banana farm and they do other crops, but one of their main crops is banana and plantain. They're in Sabana Grande, Puerto Rico, kind of in the edge of the Lajas Valley. Uh, it's an area where they get uh, uh, around 35 inches of precipitation, but with around 80 inches of evapotranspiration. This is a semi-arid region. Um, uh, the example that I'm showing today, uh, it's a 30-acre banana plantation where they use geophila macropoda as a conservation cover. This was something that the farmer have seen in, in a visit he did uh, to Costa Rica, and he uh, joined efforts with the University of Puerto, of Puerto Rico, Dr. Brian Bruner, now retired. Uh, he partnered with him to identify a similar plant in Puerto Rico uh, that he could use as a conservation cover. So they identify in the Maricao area the Geophila, geophila uh, Macropoda. Um, the, the, the story here is that uh, it took him around three months to establish the geophila to cover what you're seeing in the picture here. But, you know, he had really good uh, benefits. Uh, for example, he reduced irrigation time by 40 percent. And that 40 percent represents um, around one million of gallons, over one million of gallons of water per year. Um, given the fact of, uh, you know, this is a semi-arid region um, and that water uh, is, you know, there's an irrigation system, but, you know, water, it, it's always needed. So a saving of one million gallons. And also he reduced the glyphosate usage, usage by 80 percent, representing around forty one hundred dollars uh, for the for the. 30 acres and then 1 million gallons of water it was for the 30 acres of that, this banana specific plantation. Um, he had some challenges and one of the challenges that he had was uh, he need to keep the crown of the plant really clean because it will affect the, the, the new plants to grow uh, that they use to replant the other fields or the same field. Um, so he need to invest uh, uh, time and you know uh, resources to keep this area clean. And the other the other challenge is to get the, this conservation cover established that I mentioned that it takes around three months. Opportunities he's uh, working with other cons identifying with other uh, conservation uh, covers and co uh, cover crops in his farm and the different uh, uh, crops that he has. He also he's, he has uh, right now a conservation innovation grant with us that he's uh, validating uh, uh, other other cover uh, conservation covers I should say. The other project example that I want to talk uh, briefly here we were working uh, with Arakis Pintoy as a conservation cover uh, in coffee production to improve soil health uh, stab the, the, with the main objective to establish demonstration plots of Arakis Pintoy in coffee plantations. This is a collaborative effort uh, of NRCS's National Technology Su Support Center uh, for the Plant Materials, N NRCS Caribbean Area Soil and Ecological Science Division, the Soil and Plant Science Division, because we're going to be sampling this for dynamic soil properties. We're also collecting information for ecological site descriptions uh, with a contract we have with the Forest Service. And this is impacting uh, six uh, coffee farmers in the towns of Hayuya, Utuado, San Sebastián, and Lares. It's a really good uh, example of uh, joint efforts, and uh, it's kicking off this year. Okay, let's talk a little bit of limitations and challenges uh, implementing the strategy. I think the main one is, you know, uh, change the paradigm of conventional agriculture. And this is not only external with farmer. I think we need to work with our personnel and also our partners and how we change that paradigm from conventional agriculture to implement uh, integrated soil health management systems. Um, we also are facing that we don't have laboratories to process soil health samples and ana analysis locally, neither in Puerto Rico and USBI. 
Um, and also USDA APHIS, all of our samples, they need to go through the filter of uh, uh, APHIS uh, for the permits, and it takes a little longer to ship a sample. And we're also in the need of more soil health conservation practice validations, uh, sample cover crops and conservation cover for tropical soils. And just wanted to say that uh, this is an effort that is not done by neither Ecological Sciences or NRCS uh, Soils Division. It, this is what you see here. It's our uh, employees in the field that are the ones that are uh, making sure that, you know, this soil health uh, initiative and strategy is completed. And I conclude my presentation with a non-discrimination statement where the USDI Department of Agriculture is an equal employ opportunity employer, provider, and lender. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, I certainly need to expand my horizons and come visit Puerto Rico someday. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. Uh, so let's continue and go on, Candy. Speaker will be Pamela Voller. She came late to NRCS working with her husband in a civil engineering and environmental consulting business. Pamela earned a BS degree in biology at Boise State University, go Broncos, <laughs> and a master's degree at Washington State University in environmental science. She was hired in 2008 as an ACES employee to work in the Kenai, Alaska field office. In 2013, she was hired by NRCS as a soil conservationist, and in 2018 was transferred to the field office as the DC. Most of her clients have been specialty crop micro farmers, but has also worked with some large landowners to improve moose and salmon habitat. Welcome, Pamela, and we'll turn the presentation time over to you. Well, thank you for inviting me to be here today, and thank you for tuning in. This map shows how NRCS Alaska is divided into three hubs. I work in the South Hub, which serves Bristol Bay, the Aleutian Chain, Kodiak, and the Kenai Peninsula. And I'm stationed in the Homer office on the Kenai Peninsula. I've heard other presenters talk about how they became interested in or converted to the principles of soil health. For me, it happened in my backyard garden. I've always had gardens, but when I went back to school later in my adult life, I looked for ways to minimize the labor and time I had to spend in the garden. So I used a lot of organic mulch, interplanted crops, didn't spend much time weeding, and left most residue over the winter until just once a year in the spring before planting. My neighbor across the fence had an immaculate garden that was beautiful, and he used conventional methods for fertilizer and pest control, and the soil either supported what he had planted or it was bare. I was a little embarrassed by my messy plot, until one day, my neighbor said he wished he knew how so much came out of such an unkempt little garden year after year. I was stunned, but I also began to consider that the methods I had applied for convenience, not even considering soil health, might have additional benefits and ones that might not be available in a conventional system. So a gardening background, it turns out, was a good fit with most of the clients we work with out of this office. Most are small or even micro farmers and grow specialty crops. Fruits and vegetables for personal use, the farmer's market, restaurants, and for local grocery stores. Also, growing peonies for the cut flower market is still an expanding industry in the state. And that's what you see in that top right photo. Most of our farmers are beginning farmers and ranchers and the farms are new as well. The soils are young, generally silts of various thickness from a few inches to a few feet, with only a thin layer of humus. And previously, it was not uncommon to lose much of the humus layer through clearing when a new field was prepared. The resource concerns commonly addressed are plant productivity and health, 
organic matter depletion, and inefficient irrigation water use. Common practices we prescribe are nutrient management, conservation crop rotation, cover crop, and irrigation systems with irrigation water management. And there are hundreds of high tunnels in our area. It has been a gateway practice for us. It brought people into our office we might never have encountered otherwise. And it's created an audience interested in sustainability, organic methods, clean foods, uh, topics which open the door to discussing soil health principles. Our hub encompasses a huge geographic area, but most of the Homer office clients are on the Kenai Peninsula, shown in the map on this page and uh, live along the road system. However, we also serve communities that can only be reached by airplane and boat. And generally, these producers fall into one of the underserved categories. Some trips can be made in a day. Some can require two to three days of round trip travel and might involve two to three different air carriers and finally a boat ride to reach your site. Of course, even before the pandemic, this could limit face-to-face -face interaction due to time and even budget constraints. With new farmers in particular, this is a challenge to developing relationships and promoting conservation. Marlon asked if I could speak about promoting the principles of soil health with a particular group of producers, that is Alaska Natives. But first I wanted to touch on native land ownership in Alaska because it's a little different from the rest of the US. In 1971, through the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, over 45 and a half million acres were deeded to various native corporations. The shareholders of these corporations are all the tribal members and the corporations manage assets, including the land for the benefit of the shareholders. This map shows the 12 regional native corporation boundaries. Not all the land within the boundaries, of course, are owned by the corporations, but parcels of land within these areas were deeded to the corporations. So we work with both individual Alaska natives that own land, as well as native corporations that are the owners and operators. The majority of projects have to do with forestry and wildlife, and only a few relate so far to crop production and soil health. I've worked primarily with just one native group over several years, but I think the story provides a good illustration of an alternative route to reaching out and serving a non-traditional and underserved farming community. And I will be right up front, the conservation district was the vital and indispensable link between NRCS and the client. In the early 2000s, the NRCS Tribal Liaison brought corporation stakeholders together and introduced the concept of a tribal conservation district. The idea of being more involved in decision making and management of the corporation's natural resources appealed to the stakeholders. So in 2005, the first tribal conservation district was formed in Alaska through a mutual agreement between the local native village, the parent native corporation, and USDA. The map shows that several more districts have formed since 2005. A manager was hired for the first district and she was told development of the acre of land recently cleared for a community garden was a priority of members who lived in the village. And that's the center picture on this slide. The new manager contacted NRCS and requested a site inventory and assessment. Two issues identified were that the desired crops would not mature outdoors in this climate and the garden soils were lacking in organic matter. Because unfortunately, when the area was prepared for the garden, much of the upper soils, along with all the vegetation, were scraped into jumbled berms outside the garden. The village and the district together decided to first request help from NRCS with the installation of two high tunnels. With that project successfully completed, the client, which was the native village, was then interested in addressing soil and plant health issues inside the high tunnels, 
with nutrient management and conservation crop rotation. One element of conservation crop rotation was the use of cover crops in the rotation as a way to begin building the organic matter in the soil. Salaging organics from the berm piles or barging in compost from across the Cook Inlet were two possibilities considered and discarded for adding organics to the soil. The use of cover crops was selected as instead as probably leading to the most successful outcome. After two years, the soil test indicated organic matter had increased in the high tunnels by about 30%. Maybe even more telling, the managers found they were better able to manage soil moisture, which was important because the garden is off-grid and they rely on solar power to pump water for irrigation from a nearby lake. In addition, less weeding was needed, which was important because the community is busy in the summer with other activities such as subsistence harvest of salmon. Over the next several years, the outdoor beds were expanded, and after the success of crop rotation and cover crops in the high tunnels, both practices became a regular part of the preparation and management of each new garden area. Currently, through the Conservation Stewardship Program, the garden managers are experimenting with increasing the number of species in the cover crop mix, which is part of a three-year rotation with potatoes, cold crops, carrots, and other vegetables. This project has been a success in many ways and for many reasons. Without the regular presence of the Tribal Conservation District in the village, building relationships and trust and providing continuity, I don't know that NRCS would have had the opportunity to promote and see put into practice soil health principles in this garden. The district took direction from the community and the project has become not only a source of pride, but has been integrated into village life. For instance, at the village school, the kids start all the transplants that will be set out in the garden and they help harvest, as you can see in these photos. Youth interns are hired in summer and this is one of the only opportunities for youth employment in the village. Importantly, work days are planned so they don't conflict with subsistence fishing days. There is now an on-site year-round garden manager who also tends hydroponics operation in winter. And food goes to the elders lunch program, is purchased by the school for kids lunches, and is distributed through a CSA raffle in the village. This garden and the operations of the Tribal Conservation District has become a model for other communities as interest is increasing in the health and economic benefits of local food production, especially in off-road communities where fresh produce is expensive and sometimes in poor condition by the time it reaches town. I also consider them almost as early adopters of cover crops for building organic matter and for soil health. It has been a challenge to convince other small growers to put a portion of a field into cover crop for the entirety of our short growing season. But we now have a local example of the benefits that can be gained. My takeaway message from this project is to value you, your partners. Sometimes the best Relationships with a client might be built through an entity or a group or an individual already known and trusted. So just be ready to respond. Thank you again for inviting me and here again is my contact information. If you're interested more in the project that I just talked about, you can uh, look for Tyone Grown and you'll find the story of the entire process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Very interesting uh, working in a part of the nation that many of us have not been to, so we appreciate that. And with that, I will stop recording. <clears throat> well, thank you everyone for uh, attending and some beautiful pictures from our presenters. I really love that last one from Pamela isn't that beautiful with the beach and the ocean and the snow-capped mountains uh, very beautiful and so thanks to all our presenters I've asked uh, Stan Bolts on our soil health division to help me with many of these questions and so I'll ask a few questions one question Stan and then maybe you can dig one out um, there was an interesting comment in the chat maybe some of you guys saw it from Robert Roy he said in the PRS, 
in PRS, the system is being transferred to CD. I guess that meant conservation desktop. Um, can anybody confirm that? Hey, Marlon, this is Victor. Uh, just, just to confirm, yes, it, it, the, the, the PRS data is currently being migrated to the conservation desktop. However, it is still being figured out. Uh, so there, um, you know, your go-to place right now to, to be able to get your data is going to be on the PRS uh, program result system. Um, however, in the future, near future, it is going, that data will be migrated to the conservation desktop. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Victor, for that. Uh, a question for Amy. Uh, this is a, a question just for me, Amy. Talk to us just a little bit briefly about some of the common mulches that are used in small acreage. You you said a concept that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, now I forget it. Uh, cut and drop or something. Talk to us a little bit about mulching. Sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the common mulches, um, the one that I showed a picture of, is Gleracidia. Um, it is a tree shrub, um, depending on how it's, I've, you know, seen it can get quite tall, but often it's used as a windbreak, um, and then the chop and drop is so, things grow here, it's tropical, and so as they grow and the trimming happens, then those, um, the branches from the trimming are dropped or taken elsewhere um, for mulch. And Glaricidia is a uh, natural nitrogen fixer, um, so that's one of the added benefits of having it in the system. Um, again, it's the tropics, so we have lots of things that grow and keep growing in places where you don't want them to grow, so there's kind of a, yeah, endless supply of, of various mulching. Um, kind of a lot of people just use whatever they have available locally. Um, Many islands also have green waste um, stations, so some of our farmers will go and collect that. Um, and it is one of our most common soil health practices, especially in orchards, um, which are pretty common here. So uh, it's a very important practice for enhancing that organic matter and then um, kind of working towards more of the soil health management systems that you, we, you heard talked about today. So maybe getting that mulching in in an early stage and then hopefully maybe moving on to a conservation cover so that we get that live root and um, kind of continuous cover versus just having the mulch. Thank you, Amy. Uh, a question for you, Manuel, if you can hear and communicate with us. Uh, this is a little, this is a question for me again. Uh, if I came to Puerto Rico and taught a producer workshop in soil health, would I ha would I have to speak in Spanish, or do the producers are they bilingual? Can they understand English and Spanish? Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm having a little bit of a feedback. Oh, sounds like I lost Manuel. Manuel, if I if I lost you, we, we're not hearing you. Maybe type your answer in the chat about um, speaking in Spanish in Puerto Rico. Maybe put it in your chat. Stan, you got a question you can ask the group. Yeah, so uh, the question was asked. Let me pull this up again. I think Marcos uh, Perez asked the question, are soil health practices like conservation cover being used in high tunnels? Uh, Manuel answered that it isn't common but could be used. Um, Jennifer Foster added that mulching is used in some high tunnel systems. And Mario Rowe uh, said that a number of soil health practices are recommended in the Caribbean area to be used in high tunnels, including direct seeding, cover crops, and crop rotation. And if anybody wants to add to that, feel free to. Uh, also, uh, Marcos asked the question, is there any comparison of water savings between cover crop and mulching? I, I didn't see an answer to that, so feel free, any of you presenters, if you want to address that as well. 
much. Uh, Marlo, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, closer to the question, uh, that's a, a very challenging thing, but most of our producers, they the message will carry out in Spanish better. Uh, over 90% of our population speaks Spanish and you know, they, they, they prefer it that way. Not saying that uh, there's uh, uh, most of, of, not most of them. Some of them will understand both languages, but the, but the, the, the Spanish is the preferred for Puerto Rico. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to make comments on Stan's question about uh, uh, water savings on mulch versus cover crops? We all know that, uh, maybe I'll answer it if nobody's coming quick. Uh, that's a tough question. It takes, uh, it takes, we all know that mulches will reduce evapor evaporation uh, which is good. Uh, cover crops do take water to grow, uh, there's no doubt, but there's a ton of other benefits that you get from a living root, just not a single, a single benefit of a reduced evaporation. Um, a question for Pamela. I, I know Pamela's camera is not working, but camera, uh, Pamela, with your heavy snow load, what type of uh, structure of the high tunnels do you guys prefer? I saw a lot of the, I think it's called the Gothic style, uh, or are you seeing very many Quonset, Quonset hut type frames? Well, we're looking mostly the Gothic, the Gothic. Um, people seem to like the kits when they're available. Uh, not so many of the straight closet anymore just because people like that vertical wall at the edge is just for so it maximizes the area they can more conveniently work in. Um, we encourage everybody to remove their plastic in the winter, but you know very few growers do. And so we do get some collapses. The plastic coat of course is the things that end up bending in the summer ice so it's too great. Okay, Amy, question for you. Uh, in, in your picture with the paper mulch, it just blows me away being in windy Wyoming, but what keeps that paper mulch from not just blowing all over the farm in, in the picture you showed us? Um, the moisture, it was, you know, pretty compacted, and I think they probably wet it when they put it down, and it rains pretty frequently, so a little... A little bit more than it does in Wyoming there, um, and so it didn't really seem to be be an issue. And then once it starts breaking down, which is pretty quick, it kind of you know forms a mat and stays in place. Definitely didn't see it all over the farm blowing away, so it wasn't wasn't an issue. Okay, Stan, you got another question lined up? So yeah, um, can you hear me better now? Yes, perfect. All right. Is uh, Candy asked the question, is there any nutrient testing of available produce that is being done? Uh, and she said that's a question for all producers, but it was, I think, directed at Amy. So if you want to elaborate on your answer, I think you said that you recalled seeing research a few years back comparing nutrient levels of organic versus conventional crops. But you thought it would be interesting to see some from soil health management systems by comparison. So. I don't know if you want to add any more of that or any of the other presenters. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not aware that that's something that people are actively doing, um, at least here in, in PIA, but I think it would be really interesting to see because that is the, you know, in addition to having the benefits to the soil and we're making that kind of soil health management system for long-term sustainability, it would be interesting to see what's coming out of the soil. Um, if I recall correctly, with the organic versus conventional, there wasn't a whole lot of difference, but that was several years ago, so my, my memory could be bad. But I think it's, you know, that's just one more kind of box that we could check and say, you know, hey, here's one more thing 
that is so great about soil health and, you know, why you should adopt these practices because we need to have as many of those things as we can to, you know, really convince some of our producers that soil health is the, the way. Thank you, Amy. Manuel, a question for you. Can you expand just a little bit on, the, you made a comment about your soil health library, and are you doing anything unique to make the soil health library available to producers in your area? Yeah, we're starting uh, doing a collection of work uh, developed by the University of Puerto Rico, uh, Conservation Innovation Grant, uh, tailoring soil health, and the purpose is, uh, yeah, try to have it available to the public, kind of similar to what the, the agency did uh, some years back by topic. Did that answer your question, Mark? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think pretty good. I'm a slow learner, so I have to ans ask lots of questions. I appreciate you guys. Victor, a question for you. Uh, in the chat, it talked about uh, the parity level of, uh, of the black people in Puerto Rico. Uh, and then there was a little discussion about, you know, people would identify themselves as Hispanic versus black. Talk to us a little bit about that in, this, in the Hispanic culture. Absolutely. And uh, uh, thank you for the question. You know, that's... Uh, one thing I like to say about the Hispanic Latino community is that we are a United Nations of people. And, you know, the cultural uh, nexus is our language, uh, Espanol. Todos podemos comunicarnos en Espanol and from all different countries. Uh, however, here in the United States, we're uh, identified as a demographic of Hispanic. And so one thing you're going to notice when you go on to that parity data report is that it's now condensed to single race uh, races. Um, however, uh, before 2015, the data was uh, amplified. And so it, it, you have uh, white Hispanics, black Hispanics, Native American Hispanics, uh, Pacific Islander Hispanics, Asian Hispanics. And so what, what you come to see is that uh, Hispanics, we are of all racial backgrounds. And uh, you know, this map behind me is of the United States uh, Spanish conquest. And so you can see that uh, three uh, two thirds of, of, of our country was uh, over overseen by the uh, Spanish e e Empire, and so uh, here in the United States uh, there are many Spanish who uh, were already here uh, before uh, you know the, the United States that we know of now. Uh, you can see just the tip here, the thirteen colonies. So uh, everything else is Spanish and French influence. Thank you, Victor. We, we had another question, and maybe a couple of you presenters, if you, if you feel so inclined, can answer this question. It says, uh, do you find you have to provide very different services in historically underserved people? Um, the, different, the language barrier, the cultural barriers, different production systems. Uh, so could you guys answer that question a little bit? I'd like to chime in quickly. Um, it, it is a quite of a challenge when, uh, for example, you have uh, systems developed for temperate regions. Uh, we cannot take that and, and apply it in our region. We need to do our validation, and that takes time, resources, uh, and, and from employees and also uh, monetary resources. Plus the language. Uh, difference. Uh, it, it does create uh, a little more work for us, which it make it a little more interesting. But for us, yes, uh, it, we need to kind of using the same structure, recreate uh, for, for our specific needs. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, Pamela, do you, so when you're working with uh, the communities. Tell us some of your uh, challenges that you've had in some of the cultural barriers or working with the people of Alaska. Well, I think um, one of the first things, um, you know, personally challenges is they come here and 
want to reach out to some of the other communities is it's really uh, maybe not very helpful to just decide you're going to go somewhere, <laughs> kind of a cold open, you know, and try to reach people that way. It is important to find, say, a local group and contact them first and ask if they would be willing to host you, you know, if, to have you come to their, their community. Um, and if there might be any interest, you know, and I think that's one thing that's really important is to uh -huh. you know, that somebody has to come into the community to talk about an idea of the situation. If I may add to uh, Pamela's comments, you know, the, the NRCS provides an excellent outstanding training uh, through the employee development section, and it's the, the, working, the working Effectively series. And one thing that, to consider with Working Effectively, I mean, the overarching goal is that you learn how to do a, 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 an outreach plan so that you have a, a greater impact when you're working with historically underserved uh, communities or historically underserved farmers and ranchers. However, Pay special attention to the social and cultural cues, it, and, and the idea is that that you're not—it's not that you're going to become an expert in working with people, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all people, and, and uh, treating people with respect and dignity uh, goes a long way. Uh, however, uh, cultural and social cues that you pick up in the uh, working effectively courses—they help you navigate the conversation, and then also help you navigate that. That, that engagement so that so that you have a stronger impact and a more positive impact uh, in, 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 in so pay, pay close attention to those uh, cultural and social cues that, that are that are taught in the working effectively series uh, it, it really does work and and the, the great thing is that you're hearing it from people that from the community who are actively working with farmers and ranchers all over the country and and, and who are having great success I can add things as well. Oh, go ahead, Pamela. No, you please. I was just going to say, I agree wholeheartedly with what Victor said. Okay. Um, yeah, just a couple of success stories. Um, here in Hawaii, I know our field office in Kauai has been working to do a lot of outreach with Thai farmers. And so it's been challenging for them to communicate because the, the planners in our office don't speak Thai and um, the Thai farmers aren't very proficient in English and so they have utilized some of the resources that we have available um, but there are still limitations and challenges you know trying to have a phone call or make sure that these producers understand what they're they're signing when they sign a contract and so we were able just this week or last week um, we were able to get through the FPAC Business Center a lot of the common, you know, from the contractual side, the translation for all the different forms and appendix. Um, but I guess that would be something, um, you know, Bianca to be aware of and others in the soil health division of how we can perhaps get more. I know I've seen some Spanish um, publications of the, the common soil health things that we have, but it would be useful to have those in other languages. Um, and then also I did give a workshop for some Chinese farmers uh, in, on Oahu. And it was, it was challenging because it was a virtual, it was within the last year, so it had to be a virtual meeting. And then, of course, had to go through a translator to Mandarin. Um, but I think, you know, it was the first of, of many workshops in trying to kind of get these farmers. And, it's, you know, when you, a lot of them come, They've been farming. They, you know, kind of do have their, well, this is what my father taught me. This is what my, my grandfather taught me. And so this is just how we do things. So, and that can happen, you know, regardless of culture or background um, or race. But just this is a continued challenge of getting that, that technical and explaining why, you know, doing things differently. And also add to what Amy was saying now, um, you know, Work, work with your local field offices and um, because at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the local field representative, the soil con, the district conservationist, the planner, 
they're the ones that know the farmer. Right? They, they've developed the relationship, and, and that, that's what really what it takes. It, it, it takes spending the time with the farmer on, on the farm and, and in the office, and maybe every once in a while get, going and getting a cup of coffee. That are, we're back to normal again. And, and that's, that's the key, is building relationships. Uh, once you build relationships, you can start to build trust, and, 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 and that's what's going to really have that, imp, that outreach impact. And, and be intentional. Uh, you know, if, if, don't, don't think just traditional partners, but also think non-traditional. So, for example, if you're trying to reach the Hispanic Latino community, reach out to your local Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. If you're looking to reach the black or African American community, reach out to the uh, African American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, these are non-traditional partners, but guess what? They have business resources that, that uh, for, for the community. And so entrepreneurs and business owners, which farmers are entrepreneurs and they are business owners, they could greatly benefit from these resources. And, and when we take a look at what's, what's the greatest uh, gap or barrier for the success of a farmer, it's business acumen and, and the lack thereof. So helping connect farmers to business resources and for building business acumen, that's going to ensure that we keep farmers farming and, and at the end of the day, help them uh, continue to want to engage with resource conservation and soil health practices. I'm, I'm not hearing Marlon right now, I think, but uh, we do have a good question um, from Bianca and a kind of related question from Marcos about, uh, Marcos asked about soil testing in Puerto Rico and specific barriers and what kind of partnerships are being used to reduce some of these barriers. And then Bianca added the question about, uh, you know, the part, through partners, uh, how has relationship been built and beyond conservation districts, are there key groups you have success with? So any of you, if you want to address that with those questions. Yes. And starting with the question of the soil labs, that, that's been a problem historically where the DA, Department of Agriculture, used to do those tests. Um, but for normal chemical analysis, then uh, it, they took longer than uh, in, in comparison to a soil lab in the U.S. And recently they had... Uh, abandoned to invest on their own lab and we're starting uh, with communications uh, with different professors from the University of Puerto Rico to develop a soil health lab locally but that's just uh, the start of it but it's it, definitely need to be done joining efforts. That's a great idea. Yeah. Hopefully that'll move it forward. Yeah, and I think Any yeah. I think Victor kinda answered that same question. Uh, but in this what other key groups are you working with besides our go to conservation districts? Yeah, so uh, there, there are many resources out there. And, you know, one thing as a uh, beginning farmer rancher coordinator here in California, what I strive to do with, with farmers and ranchers is introduce them to partners outside of USDA. And, and, and really the, the, the idea there is that you're, you're looking to keep businesses in business. And so looking at business resource partners like the Small Business Administration, uh, the Small Business Development Centers, SCORE Mentors, uh, veteran Business Outreach Centers, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, those are just a few. The Minority Business Development Center, uh, those are all non-traditional partners. So they, they usually, for us at, here at NRCS, we're not, they're not going to be the, the partner that we think of right off the bat. But when we're thinking about helping farmers develop business plans and, and, and learning how to navigate uh, uh, business technology like QuickBooks or uh, using social media more effectively, branding, market placement, those, those are all excellent partners to, to filter those farmers to 
so that they can uh, ensure that, so we can ensure that farmers stay in business so that they can continue to, to take care of their conservation concerns. And, and that's the key there is that many, far, I think farmers at large in general uh, have, uh, have an interest in resource conservation and soil health practices. However, when, when, when you go through the economics of, of conservation course, you come to find out that what farmers really care about is the bottom line. How, how, how quickly am I going to get a return on my investment? And, and, and you know, that, how they're going to learn that, you know, we teach them a little bit, but working with business partners and building business acumen, that helps them go a little bit further. Uh, the other non-traditional partners you can look at are educational resources. And there are many um, colleges and universities uh, across the country who support farmers and ranchers uh, with with business education or farming education for those that, that want to do that. There's even community-sponsored courses for agriculture. Um, however, you, you can also think of some of the incubator programs. Uh, here in California, we have the Center for Land-Based Learning. Uh, you also have uh, Alba Farms. Uh, you have Archie's Institute for Sustainable Agriculture working with farmer veterans. Uh, so some of these type of incubator types of programs uh, you, you know, introducing the farmers to them, it's a, it's a quick crash course where they learn from seed to market on the farm from, from people who uh, are supporting farmers and ranchers. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's a good, that's a good uh, matchmaking right there. Very good. I, I think in my short... I, Go ahead, Amy. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to follow up on what Victor said, um, kind of an example of that. We had a contribution agreement, um, it just completed this year, with Pacific Resources Education and Learning, so kind of a, a little bit outside of our normal partnership. We were able to partner with them um, to have soil health workshops across Micronesia and the Republic of the Marshall Islands, um, kind of places where we had struggled perhaps to do outreach. Um, and. It was beneficial because and it was interesting because it's like, well, but you're working with, with schools, you know, we want to work with farmers. And the response was, well, the teachers at the schools are also the farmers or they're, you know, they're all working together. And these are such small communities of subsistence farmers that it was all kind of one and the same and it worked out really well. Um, so there, there are success stories of kind of getting to those communities in maybe a different way than what. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. That, 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 that is so important what Amy just said with with community based organizations that maybe have nothing to do with business and have nothing to do with agriculture. Because when you're looking at um, what uh, you know, look for social uh, justice types of organizations in your community, like a community action network, um, also uh, the community health network, uh, because a lot of historically underserved uh, communities. Uh, who don't have usually the limited resource uh, farmers and ranchers, they, 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 they go to these services uh, because they don't have the means to go to, but they don't have a health insurance plan, so they don't go to the hospital. They go to the community health uh, uh, location. Uh, you know, they're, 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 they're living on subsistence, they're on subsistence living, so they're going to the social services. And so those, those, those are all uh, key areas to, to, uh, to attend to, and, and that, that's, you know, Culture trump strategy, and so the, you, you got to be aware of the cultural background. Where, where, you know, how, what, what's, what's the socioeconomic di dynamic uh, for the, this, this, your pocket of farmer community, and, and where do they go to get information? Thank you. Uh, maybe one last comment uh, from Bianca. She's, you know, she says that soil health is a win-win for. Con conservation and economics. Uh, as presenters, how much do you think more economics and soil health would influence adoption by historically underserved producers? Manuel, do you got a thought on that? Um, I just want to say, just uh, adding to what Victor says, and then I continue with uh, Bianca's uh, question, but I'll say, and, and this was probably learned it, uh, some time ago, is that conservation doesn't end at 4.30. And uh, you, you, you work with your community through volunteering and your church, you know, and you try to carry that message as well and extend that outreach. Um, 
So in the in terms of the question of Bianca, absolutely, we need we need more examples of outcomes in terms of economics. Kind of like I mentioned, we went through the exercise of calculating how much uh, or what represented the 40% of uh, time reduction in terms of gallons of water. That translates to economics. That translates to the right use or the correct use of resources, especially you know water. Uh, and the same with with all their inputs that farmers are putting in their in their operation, that if we can translate that to savings in their pocket, you know, at the end of the day, that's what they're going to be after. And if you're getting, not to mention, you know, good benefits in soil health, right, for a long-term sustainability, that's that's a win-win. But definitely, we need to invest more time on developing those scenarios where we can present to farmers. Uh, what are those, uh, you know, doing soil health, you're, you're saving money and not lasting your operation. And we, we can't go without giving a shout out to David Buland. I know I see his name in here. And uh, Hal Gordon with the economics uh, uh, team. Wow, you all put out amazing information. And, but you know, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not out in the field working one-on-one -on -one with the farmer, but go, having gone through the economics uh, course, I think that if, if we can present the economic value uh, and, and the return on investment, how quickly am I going to get a return on, on investment, that, that that makes it such a clear selling point. I mean, as, as a business-minded person, it, I want to know what my return on investment is and, and what, what my bottom line is going to look like and how soon am I going to get a return on, 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 on this capital investment for soil health. So if we have that for the different soil health practices, in my mind, in my opinion, I think that that, that definitely carries carries the initiative uh, much stronger. Yes, one thing we've done in Soil Health Division in this last six months or, or a year is we've developed another uh, social economic module for our three-day soil health certification course, and, and it seems to be uh, pretty well perceived. So. Stan, any other uh, any other questions on your end? Well, if we have still have a little time, there's a question from Marcos uh, asking if anyone is doing work to incorporate Native American traditional ecological knowledge in, in soil health practices. Uh, maybe. Um, I. Um not that I know of. I know there's an effort to incorporate um, traditional knowledge with some of the work that's being done with wildlife, for instance. But not so much with soil health yet. That's a, a pretty new topic. So there's some of the groups that we're working with. Okay. Anybody else that would have to be? Go ahead. Well, Dan, maybe I'll just make a comment. In Wyoming, I've uh, spoken to several tribes over the years, and we, we didn't have that exact discussion, but uh, I know the American Indian tribes, the producers that I've spoken to, they understand and accept soil health quite well because I think uh, they are so close to, to Mother Earth and, and respect, that, uh, expect, respect that nature. Uh, has a process of how she functions, and so it's been actually pretty easy to communicate those yeah. points of interest to the American Indians. In South Dakota, they've been uh, working pretty closely with uh, some of the tribes uh, in the Plant Materials Center and developing some of those plant materials uh, that are that are you know important to those mm. uh, their traditional uh, workings and stuff. So. But I, I haven't seen as much directly related to soil health practices, but that's a good good idea to, to look at. Okay, well, Amy, Victor, Manuel, Pamela, uh, thank you very much for spending uh, your afternoon with us, uh, whatever time zone you're in across the nation today. and. 
I think we'll close with that and leave a few comments for uh, uh, Bianca. So turn it back over to you as we close out, Bianca. Thank you, Marlon, and thank you to all of you, you know, Amy, Manuel, Victor, Pamela. It's been really interesting to hear from you all. I think you have so much expertise to share, so many perspectives. I'm just really appreciating the diversity that's coming, even just from, from your four location. And I'm hoping that some other folks that are out there and who are listening in on this, it, it made you think of some things that you could do where you are. Um, I think I think all of our speakers are, are uh, welcoming to anybody reaching out to them for more questions. I think we all want to work together as a big team. I think there's just so much opportunity here. So really excited to have had you all on. Thank you very much for joining us today, spending that time with you. And uh, we'll look forward to next time. So thanks, everybody. Welcome to new participants, and welcome back to those of you who have joined.